Now remember, if you have a suggestion for the next retro wrestling review video, whether it be an old Raw, SmackDown, Nitro, Thunder, uh, pay-per-view, DVD set, movie, whatever the case might be, I am open to any and all suggestions. Make your suggestions in the comment section. If you see somebody else's suggestion and you like it, the best thing to do is thumbs it up so that way I know it has the most interest. And then you go to social media once I post it out there for voting options in the Twitter poll and on the Facebook page. And that's how we determine the topic. And I ultimately knew, I just deep down knew, that when we got to September, that this particular show was going to come up. That this particular show was going to be suggested that this show was going to be pretty popular in terms of a choice. And I wasn't ultimately that surprised uh, when it was suggested, was presented as a voting option, and you pretty largely voted for me to review the September 13th, 2001 edition of SmackDown. I'm not surprised. I think it has a lot to do, obviously, with the timeliness of the event, mostly. Some of you may want to hear um, my thoughts about that time in our history. Might want to hear my thoughts about uh, the version of events that day. Some of you probably really want to hear about them for a variety of reasons. And I'm sure I will touch on all of that in this video. But I, I want to start off by saying this first, is that... This episode of SmackDown, and we've had tribute shows over the years, and we've had different things and all of that. To me, this is the single most unique, weird, one-of-a-kind episode of television WWE ever put out. Even, you know, after the death of Owen Hart at Over the Edge 99, and the deaths of Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, so on and so forth, You've done different tribute shows and so on. You know, there have been tribute shows. There will be future tribute shows. Um, I don't think you've ever had a show that was quite like this against this type of backdrop. And going back and watching this show 16 years later, it's got, it was a little tough of a watch for me. Not from an emotional standpoint, not, not whatsoever. It was, as I've gotten older, I find myself to be much more jaded, much more cynical. And, and you that guys that have watched me for years know that to be true. So, you know, I look at things, I'm very cynical about them, and I'm very like, ah, give me a fucking break, or oh, get over your fucking self. And sometimes it's easy to remove yourself from the reality of what was 16 years ago. It's easy to forget. And, and it is. And let me take a step back to 2001, just kind of give you a little backdrop on um, what I was doing at that period of time in my life. I was 20 years old. Uh, that morning, Tuesday, September 11th, it was a sunny morning um, when the first tower had gotten hit. Um, my mom had uh, woken me up and let me know that the first tower had been hit. So I got up in time to ultimately see uh, the second tower get hit live. <clears throat> so I was there watching on TV, honestly, pretty much the entire day as events went down. And ultimately my employer, uh, which at the time was MCI WorldCom, if anybody remembers the people that used to call you and bother you at dinner time, try to sell you long distance. Uh, that was me back in those days. Um, so... I, I remember, too, I had friends that were working in the morning. I worked in the evening shift, so I worked like uh, 4 to 10, if I remember correctly. And forgive me, it's been 16 years, so I believe it was something like 4 to 10. But I knew people that were working that morning, that were calling people literally as this was going on. And as greedy of a work environment as that was and how much it was about sales and everything else, even the reality came in is, oh, my God, we don't know what's happened. We need to shut down our operations now. And they ultimately did for that day. And I mean, it was just, I, it was a unique, one-of-a-kind day, clearly. Um, and then I remember having to go into work that next night. And I, 
remember the, with the morning crew, they had to fire 30 people that day because they were committing what we called tier one escalations, which were immediately fireable offenses. Talking about in times like these, it's more important now more than ever to have long distance service. I'm like, oh baby, I wish I had that golden script at night. Yeah, they had put the kibosh out of by then, but yeah, we had to fire like 30 people that morning for saying that type of shit. <laughs> but I will never forget having to go back to work on September 12th. You know, as everywhere, all the TV, it's 24-7, nonstop, wall-to-wall 9-11 coverage, which, which is understandable considering the significance of the event. But from my standpoint, it was kind of like, I need my sports. I want something else to fucking watch. I don't want to hear about this shit all the time. Let's get down with it. Uh, so I needed the distraction of work. And it's kind of crazy because the single best sales day I ever had before I got promoted to be a sales supervisor, the single best day that I ever had as a salesperson was September the 12th, 2001. And it was a unique dichotomy of a day if there ever was one. You would call and have people cuss and scream at you. How dare you call us? We've been attacked. We've been at war and all this dumb fear mongering bullshit. But to be fair to them at the time, we didn't know what was going on. Nobody really knew. Um, you would have people that would sit there and just talk to you about what was going on. I'd ask them what they were talking about on the television. You'd have people that'd be like, you know what? I do need to sit there and get on point with this because I'm going to be calling my friends and family members more. On that particular day, as productive as I was as a salesperson in general, I did double the amount of lines sold and any other day. And I didn't want to work that day, really, honestly. Even though I knew I needed the distraction, I did not want to work that day. thought it was dumb that we were open to everything else. It's just kind of weird and ironic how everything worked out that I ultimately ended up working that day. But go back to work the next day, September the 13th. I was glad to find out that WWE was going to be doing SmackDown that night because I'm like, man, do I need this distraction because I know the NFL is not going to be doing games on Sunday. I need something other than damn video games uh, to distract me. So 16 years ago, I went to work. I taped SmackDown on my VCR. Yeah, For some of you kids, the VCR, the thing that you've seen at the thrift stores now, it's a, it's a video cassette. You used to record and rewind and do a bunch of cool things with it. Um, basically, you could not watch it for 10 years. And if you didn't rewind it, you put it back in. It'd be at the exact spot that you left it off. So I came home after I work and I watched it that night. And let, let's be honest, especially going back now, but even back then, it was a tough watch. This is not a very good show. Nor did it need to be, nor was it designed to be, um, nor could it really be. To be the smartass, I could say that even 9-11 couldn't end the invasion angle. So, so we missed one there. But uh, all joking aside, <laughs> I know that was bad, but all joking aside, 9-11 couldn't stop the invasion angle. But ultimately, 9-11 also did not stop the WWE. And it felt very appropriate that night that the first thing you saw as they went live in Houston is Vince McMahon in the ring. Because at that time, at that time, you thought somebody like a Vince McMahon truly had, it wasn't just caricature, it just it wasn't just a character. You truly thought this guy had balls the size of grapefruits. He wasn't afraid of anything. He gave no fucks. He would go into any situation, anywhere, anytime. You felt like a Vince McMahon at this stage of his life. And if you were going into a foxhole or something, going into a scrap, a battle, no matter where you were, um, that that would be a guy that you would want in your corner. So when Vince McMahon is out there and he's talking, it just felt right. There was a bit of a comfort level that came along with seeing Vince McMahon. Because it is easy to forget in the grand scheme of things, especially with the passage of time, that 16 years ago, on a little over 48 hours after 9-11, there were a lot of people in the country that were absolutely terrified. 
They didn't know what was coming. They didn't know if there were going to be more attacks. They didn't know if going to a venue like that meant they were going to be blown up. You needed somebody like Vince McMahon to tell you it was okay. I mean, I mean, really, truly. And I don't mean to come across as a Vince McMahon shill here, but I really, truly feel like this was one of Vince's finest hours. I really, truly feel like Vince was an early part of the beginning process of helping people to get back to their lives as normal. And it took a man of great courage and great balls, which he had both a plenty in great abundance at this stage of his life, to walk out there, no bulletproof vest, no anything. I'm Vince McMahon, damn it! And I'm proud to be of an American! And seeing him, I think, put a lot of people at ease. I really, truly believe that. And I feel like I know for me back then, 16 years ago, as much as anything else, that this show was therapeutic. Because as you watch the show uh, as it plays out, and you see Edge is a blubbering fool, honestly. You see The Rock. I mean, The Rock, at the height of being The Rock, is basically reduced to being a blubbering bitch. Think about that. The Rock, of all people who many people hold up as the epitome of masculinity and manhood, was a blubbering bitch. And you had people talking about their families, you know, when they would interview the different people. You had people talking about how terrible this was and their thoughts and prayers and condolences. Some people were so overcome with emotion they could barely say anything. And you had the people like the JBL that were standing up saying, we're going to get you sons of bitches and all of this other stuff. But, but to me, you know, for Vince McMahon to come out there and cut, I don't want to say cut the promo, but to make the speech that he did, I thought was very therapeutic to his roster, to his company, to a lot of people, and frankly, probably a lot of Americans, even if they don't realize it. And I think when you look at the backdrop of history and you look at the backdrop of what was going on at that time, I really, truly believe it was one of Vince McMahon's finest hours, if not perhaps his finest hour. It's probably the one thing you really, truly remember about that show outside of Lillian Garcia knocking it out of the ballpark uh, with the national anthem. And obviously, again, it was a very nationalistic, patriotic time. So everybody's out there on the ramp. Some of, them are, some of the performers are holding up the American flags. People are crying. Lillian Garcia is crying. It was a riveting performance. And I think, again, one of her finest hours as well. I think as you go back and look through the scope of history on this show, you don't really remember any of the wrestling that happened on this show. I mean, all the matches were pretty short. But I do remember that these guys went out there and still performed. And even like as much of a blubbering bitch as Rock was at that time, when it came time for him to go out there and he did whatever the hell they were trying to do with him and Sean Stasiak, he still did Excuse me, he still did it. He was still The Rock. Before that, Christian comes out, and he still tries to be Christian. Chris Jericho comes out and still tries to be Chris Jericho. Leave it to the two Canadians to try and make things right. Uh, but what a hell of a backdrop for these guys to have to go out there and perform in. What a hell of a backdrop for these guys to have to work in. And, and I, I will always express a tremendous amount of respect for those individuals in WWE that had to go out there and work that night, that had to go out there and wrestle that night, when they probably really didn't want to. Because even though you know deep down they really didn't want to, even if they felt like it was the right thing to do and they needed to, just because you felt like you needed to doesn't mean you wanted to. It was hard to tell watching. Now granted, based off of the backdrop of the night and the emotions going into it, uh, like I said, the show is very tough to watch, especially going back in the history of time now that you remove yourself from some of the emotion 16 years later. It's a bunch of people blubbering on about stuff and getting all caught up in it. And you get kind of cynical as you get older and you're like, oh, give me a fucking break. Get over it. You know, life goes on. But I, but I think it is important for us to look back at a moment like that in history and learn some important lessons. I think number one, the most important thing to learn is that... Um, as much as anything else, it's important to not allow fear to dictate how you live your life. I think that is a fundamental requirement to happiness in your life. You cannot be afraid. You cannot live in fear. No matter what is out there that could potentially cause you fear, whether it's an event like 9-11, whether it's something else, whether it's the neighborhood you live in, 
As Vince said, we refuse to live our lives in fear. That is just one thing, regardless of political views, regardless of your view on the world, your view on life in general, I think the one thing you cannot do is live your life in fear. Because when you get to that point in time, you're really not living at all. Um, the next thing I think that is very important is that you learn some of the consequences or from some of the consequences that arise out of a situation like that and don't get so caught up in them where you allow history to repeat itself because that post 9-11 world i mean let's face it whether we like it or not whether we always believe in the official version of events or whether we have our own thoughts or our own opinions there is no denying that 9-11-01 changed our world fundamentally and some of you may not be old enough to have seen that change. Some of you might not be old enough to remember how it was before. The world has fundamentally shifted and changed. And it hasn't necessarily been a fundamentally good shift and change. That's for sure. Um, but, you know, the, the rash reaching of conclusions and automatically assuming this or taking a few bad apples and letting that spoil the entire bunch or allowing uh, xenophobia to strike and... You know, getting away from logic and reason and being guided by our fears and our emotions and passions can put us in a bad place and can be very dangerous. And, and again, that, that, that's it's just the way it is. And I think that's one thing when you look at what happened on that day in the aftermath when it comes to the Patriot Act, when it comes to the authorization of use of military force, when it comes to now we can call it a war on terror, what a genius thing it is for the industrial military complex because we don't ever have to have a definitive end date for a war. It's the ultimate way to keep us in a perpetual state of war because we could sh shift the narrative from an Al-Qaeda to an ISIS to whoever the next group is and always be in some type of foreign entanglement. And I don't think you have to be anti-patriotic to think that at all. Because I think that's kind of like a common sense thing. I would hope. But it, but it is important to learn the lessons of the day. And I, I, again, I will say this. The show is not very good. Outside of Vince's speech and Lillian's performance of the National Anthem, you really don't need to watch the rest of the show. Hence why I'm not really talking about the show. Because at the end of the day, did you really want me to talk about the show? No, because there really wasn't much to talk about. As far as those of you that want to know my thoughts on the day, I will put it this way. I go in a couple of places. Number one, even back then, 16 years ago, the first couple of days after the event, like the first thing that ever happened that really made me stop and pause and be like, huh, was the incident in the field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, Shanksville, Pennsylvania where it's supposed to be a plane crash, but I see like almost no debris. It's just a freaking hole in the field. What the hell? Then Tower 7, I actually watched that collapse live on television. And as soon as I happened, my first thought was, oh, they brought that down via controlled demolition. That's literally what I thought. I was like, why did they destroy that building too? Especially since it was on the outskirts of of the World Trade Center complex. Those are questions that were even brought up at that time. Or back in 2001, and again, understanding it based off of the backdrop of 2001, where I had a cell phone that barely worked anywhere I tried to use it, as these stories started to come out about people using their cell phones at 30,000 feet, which is still a technological challenge today based off of elevation, based off of speed, and based off of how cell phone exchange, cell phone signal has to be exchanged from one tower to the next and all of this, thinking about 2001, the phones barely worked on the ground half the damn time. And you're telling me all these people were able to make cell phone calls at 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35,000 feet? So even back then in 2001, there were things about it that I just questioned and I was like, what the fuck is going on here? And then you get the implementation of the Patriot Act. You're going after Afghanistan, even though most of the alleged hijackers were Saudi Arabian. I thought that was very interesting. I'm like, 
Are we not going after Saudi Arabia because of oil interest? What did you want to investigate where most of these guys actually came from and whatever? But then over the years, I've seen the 9-11 Commission, which was anything other than a real true investigation. The bottom line to look at it is, even if you don't want to believe massive conspiracy theory, you don't want to believe it was an inside job, a false flag operation or anything like that, whatever. But to sit there and say that there was a full and complete investigation when you refused to investigate any potential uh, financial ties with Saudi Arabia to the hijackers, when you didn't mention Tower 7 once in the report, that's not a complete investigation. And to this day, I, I say this. For those that immediately want to dismiss those that don't believe in the official story of 9-11, I say this. Number one, to call somebody a crackpot conspiracy theorist is kind of like the pot calling the kettle black. Because even if you believe 100% in the official story of 9-11, it is still a conspiracy. Multiple people involved, multiple events and organizations that helped plan it out. No matter what you believe, the bottom line is it was a conspiracy. What conspiracy you believe in is up to you. But even the official version of events is still ultimately, fundamentally a conspiracy. And it speaks to the ridiculousness of our society. It speaks to the foolishness of us as a people that we can't even agree on basic kind of fundamental facts is that this was a conspiracy. Just like the assassination of Abraham Lincoln historically was part of a grander conspiracy. No matter what you believe with 9-11, something, multiple events, everything else, you believe in some type of conspiracy. And I think over the years, I've seen too many people that are so quick to automatically jump to a conclusion that it was a false flag or this or that because of some other unnatural fear or paranoia. And again, not really a way to live your life. On the flip side, you've seen those that are naive in the world and are so willing to accept whatever is spoon fed them to where maybe because of fear, they don't want to look any deeper. They're just going to accept whatever is presented to them. Again, fear is not a way to live your life. So yes, I have all types of questions about the day. Because from a logic-based standpoint, there are gaping holes that you can fly a 767 through, pardon my pun here, about a lot of the official events of that day. There are certain things that do not wash when it comes to science. There are just some things from a common sense standpoint, like even if you take out controlled demolition for Tower 7 and even with the Twin Towers, you ask yourself, how is Building 7, which was the furthest out, you know, it was kind of on the flank of the World Trade Center complex. How was that building that had fires, some that were more severe than others throughout the building, how did that come down ultimately at basically free fall speed? Um, whereas building three, the Marriott, if I remember correctly, was, you know, just in between the two buildings was absolutely destroyed, but still didn't totally collapse. Building six had a massive hole in the middle of it, but it didn't collapse. You know, building four, building five, these buildings were ruined, but they didn't collapse in that capacity. They still had some floors that were still standing. You know, it's just, you know, things like how does a plane hit up at the 90th level or the 80th level and the entire building collapse? How do people sit there and say, oh, jet fuel caused that when that's kerosene it doesn't burn at a temperature hot enough to melt steel. You can say, well, it could burn at a hot enough temperature to weaken steel. But even if it weakened steel, it would have had to do it very quickly because most of it was burned out in the initial fireball. And you're talking about office fires. That's only going to burn at a couple hundred degrees Celsius. That's true. Uh, so how did that cause an entire building to collapse? Why did NIST? I mean, I could go on and on and on. There are just so many significant questions and if you're keep an open mind on it and don't automatically dismiss it it will leave you with questions too now look i'm not just sitting here and automatically saying that it was a false flag operation i'm not sitting here and saying that president bush did it at all of that because if anything i would be much more likely to believe a dick cheney and rumsfeld and such would be behind it that to me would be much more believable if we were going down that path whereas bush would have been kept completely out of the lurch because of plausible deniability and so forth. It could have been Saudi Arabia that did it. It could be any number of a variety of factors. It could have been a CIA operation. It could have been any number of things. It could have went down somewhat like they said it did that day. 
It's just the evidence isn't that great to support that official narrative. And honestly, it's not. I mean, my whole point is there's nothing wrong with questioning it. And what happens is, is we get so many people that are so convinced of their beliefs one way or another, we get into fear. We're afraid of being wrong. I don't think I've ever really truly given my opinion 100% fully on what I thought happened that day. Because the honest truth is, is I don't fully know. I believe the truth has not been discovered. I do believe that the truth is still out there. I also don't know if we'll ever truly come to a consensus on what that truth is. But to me, one truth that I do know is that the official story is bunk. What I do know is that the 9-11 Commission was a whitewash operation. And if you've actually read the report like I have, if you actually have looked into some of these matters over the years from a scientific, from a logic standpoint, things just don't wash and they just don't hold up. And at least I could say all these years later is one thing that I learned from that day and other events over the years is to try and keep as much of an open mind as possible and not be afraid to question things. And even though I come on here and so often will act with a conviction of the righteousness of what I believe, because many times I am right when it comes to wrestling, the fact is trying to keep an open enough mind to see through the trees and see that there could be other realities out there. Sometimes there are. Many times they're not. But I think it's important to go back and look at moments in time and history like this and learn from them. And unfortunately, I think 16 years later, we've only gotten worse as a people, especially specifically the U.S., not better. Um, and even though over the years with uh, different disasters that happened and different things, and even with the brave first responders on that day as as shit was happening at the towers, they were running in as other people were running away. You know, the fact that these guys years later had to fight to get their benefits as first responders were using that day as propaganda to advance a war narrative, but we can't take care of these guys. There seems to be something fundamentally fucking wrong with that. When a comedian like Jon Stewart is the one that has to be taken seriously on an issue like that, we have a problem here. And all these years later, we still have a problem here. You could go on social media every day with the political environment we have in this country and just realize how much of a problem we still have. <clears throat> but if you want to know more of my thoughts about that day and what I think happened or what I question, um, you can hit me up on Twitter, what have you. I'm not going to bore you with any of that anymore. But yes, I do not believe in the official version of events of 9-11. Uh, because I just don't think there's enough evidence to fully support them. You could pretend like there is, but there are just too many gaping holes. And from a logic and scientific standpoint, some of them just don't hold up. Now, there is a lot of uh, alternative theories out there, and some of them are crackpot crazy. and aren't necessarily prescribed to them. I think as you go along with the different theories, the different options, I think there are some that hold more plausibility than others. I think some that at least, if anything else, raise some legitimate questions. And it, it's not wrong to question. And if you get anything out of this whole video from me, always know as long as you watch this channel, even if sometimes I come at you like clown college, and even if sometimes I go to try and poon you and this and that, know that you always be okay to question me and question things that I say. I'm not going to block you like other bitches out there on social media, like other bitches on YouTube. You're not going to get censored. You're not going to get blocked because you question things I say or, God forbid, you have a different opinion than I do. So there you go. But ultimately, when it comes to this edition of SmackDown, it took me like three days to watch it because, really, honestly, it was fucking boring as bricks. Because I get removed of the emotion of 16 years ago, and I'm so cynical and jaded about so much of it, I'm like, oh, give me a fucking break. Get over it. Ta-ta today, Junior. But I cannot deny that the WWE made the right call 16 years ago. And I needed them to make that right call 16 years ago. I think it was one of WWE's finer hours. And I, like I said, I most specifically for sure felt like it was one of Vince McMahon's finest hours. Because people were looking for something to gravitate to to say, it's okay to not be afraid. And of all people, of all the things people could say about him over the years, it took somebody like Vince McMahon 
to help us start living our lives normally again. And for that, believe it or not, I will always be thankful.